This special episode is sponsored by O'Reilly Auto Parts. The professional parts people will help you pick out the perfect gift for that hard-to-shop-for person on your list this year. Stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts, or you can go online. You can shop at O'ReillyAuto.com. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the choice. We're going to mandate. Get it on. And welcome to a special presentation, Adam Carolla Show. I'm at the Daily Wire in uh, Tennessee, everybody. And uh, when I come out here, I got to say hi to my old friend, Jason Whitlock. Good to see you, my friend. Very good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking of me. I I always think of you. Um, Because I love your takes, and I love that you feud with everybody. (laughs) And I I love, I mean, I, I am attracted, not physically, but that's on the table. <laughs> Nothing's off the table. <clears throat> I'm attracted to anyone who says I'm going right when the whole world's going left or I'm stopping when the whole world is going. I, I found that with COVID, everyone who had an alternative viewpoint, I just said, I don't always agree with them, but I respect them. And <clears throat> you have, have been that way in sports. When did sports get so incredibly woke sports was never that way when i was growing up and even just a few years ago yeah i would say that nike's influence on the sports world isn't fully understood and Mm -hmm. recognized that nike is actually the most powerful force in sports people think it's the nfl (laughs) it's not it's nike uh, Nike's like a fifty billion dollar a year business. The NFL is eighteen to twenty billion dollars a year. Uh, Nike, like the NBA, is just the marketing department for Nike, mm-hmm. and and so Nike is so fascinated and so motivated by uh, its relationship uh, with China and getting to those one point four billion consumers and making sure. They're in good standing with the the Communist Chinese Party or the Chinese Communist Party that, you know, they have made the sports world woke and athletes are just following the lead or the advice of the shoe companies and Nike. And, And so, you know, now the real tipping point where everybody could just see like, wow, things have gone really far left was obviously Colin Kaepernick in 2016. Mm -hmm. That completely changed sports and made it crystal clear you need to be woke uh, uh, to be in the good graces of, you know, the shoe industry and corporate media and all of that. So Yeah, how much of it is spoken versus unspoken? Like, I, my belief is there becomes a, a culture and then you don't really need to sit down and give people their talking points. You understand the culture. Like, it's like when the thing went down with China and the guy from the Mavericks or whatever team. Daryl Moore. Yeah, the right. That's why Houston. you're here. Right. Rock. And then they go to Steve Kerr, who has a take on everything under the sun as it pertains to race or inequality or whatever. They ask him about China. He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't read up on it. I don't really know. <laughs> the guy never stops flapping his lips about everything, all subjects, all the time. He doesn't need to know any of the official particulars on any of them. All of a sudden buttons it up when someone asks him about China. LeBron James starts to find, does somebody speak to them or is it understood? Meaning, uh, you know, we're here at the Daily Wire. If... Ben Shapiro just started walking around here with a Steelers jersey on. After a couple of weeks, how many other people would be wearing a Steelers jersey around here? And then who would leave the Ravens jersey at home? Do you you know what I mean? Is it that or is there an actual memo that goes out? There's no memo, but for the athletes... Their agents tell them which direction the wind is blowing and which direction the money's flowing. And so uh, LeBron James knows exactly what he's doing. And particularly, many of the NBA players know exactly what they're doing because they make so much money that's never talked about over in China. These, they take summer trips to China every year, 
and they collect major, major checks. It's like we think we love basketball here in America. LeBron and James Harden and Kevin Durant and all these guys know, like, no, they love basketball in China. They built a – Stefan Marbury, after like a 10-year NBA career, he went over to China and made more money. They have a statue of Stefan Marbury in China. He was worshipped in China. And so uh, these guys know that the NBA strategy has been – David Stern launched this strategy 30 years ago. We're going to be the international game. We'll never be as popular as the NFL in America, but we're going to be the international game. And one day the plan was that – China was going to cut a check to televise NBA games that was going to dwarf anything ESPN or ABC or TNT could ever pay. They, they were playing a long game for this international appeal and this big paycheck from the CCP. And Daryl Morey, and that's why LeBron and everybody were pissed off. They're like, man, Daryl Morey just cost us billions of dollars. We, we, right, by speaking out. Yes against yeah. uh, China. And so, yeah, they know, and their agents tell them, because, you know, agents' job is to make these guys more money, and, you know, China, and, and now look now look at what Saudi Arabia has did to the PGA Tour, mm -hmm. the, these foreign countries investing in our athletes and recognizing that you can use sports culture to influence all of American culture. Right. It's... yes. No, and it's it's insidious. I've said it many times, you know, LeBron James talking, of, you know, race hustling, talking about being scared to leave his house as a black man, you know. <laughs> Obviously, with all the crazy race hustling and the hoax that's going on in this country and how detrimental it is to everybody in this country, especially the young black kids who you're trying to, you're professing to love. You know, if, if LeBron James and Oprah Winfrey and the Obamas and some of the tastemakers would step up and start saying, listen, this isn't an inherently racist nation. You have nothing to worry about. Let's everyone get to work. They could make a huge impact, but they won't. They just keep the hustle going, which is so insidious. He, Adam, I, I want to say this, though. They're not going to pivot. They know exactly what they're doing. Yes. They, 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 a communist agenda does not hurt them because elites are fine under communism and Marxism. And so it's really not on them. We should have no expectations on them. It's actually on us. And it's actually on, I'm a, and I hate to do this, but I got to do it, it's white men. Mm. They, here's, this is my number one message to white men and basically all men. Stop apologizing stop yeah. apologizing men have done nothing wrong i'm just telling quit apologizing for america's history our history does not provoke shame it it should provoke gratitude like wow these people made incredible sacrifices so jason whitlock and adam carolla could have all of this freedom and we could we could create the freest most opportunity rich place on the entire planet, and then for black people, it's the safest place, you have the longest life expectancy, you have the most opportunity to move up economically. Quit apologizing. And if, if we would- Sorry, man. <laughs> we, that, that's my message there. No, I, I comp look, you're 100% right. I've said this until I'm blue in the face. Uh, stop apologizing. I've, I've told everyone this all the time. I, I hope you know that I never, yeah. I don't go in for right. any of this shit. But, and, and yes, it, the, the, the guilty white men and women become the foot soldiers. I, I would say the generals are still kind of the Obamas, although I don't expect anything from them. But I must say, I'm kind of disappointed. Like, I'm kind of disappointed that like the Obamas or an Oprah or LeBron, like somebody who's very prevalent in the in the black community, like doesn't step up. I, I get it. I think it, people do. They do step up and then the corporate media machine shuts them down 
marginalizes them, diminishes their voice, and tells you that, hey, Al Sharpton's more successful than Clarence Thomas or Ben Carson. Right. And and so, but, but I, I want to make one small distinction here. When I say stop apologizing, though, and I'm talking to men, we have to stop apologizing to women because this whole matriarchal system that they're trying to install is is women fighting for power under the excuse of, man, do you know how sexist you guys were for two, three hundred years? And and no, men were not sexist because women in, say, the 1800s, 1700s, they weren't saying, you know what, I really want to go out here and do all this farming and hunting. I want to do all these, the things that establish the workforce. You guys out there building railroads and blowing up mountains, and I want to do that. They weren't saying that. Right. Because technology has allowed women to pretend like, yeah, we would have been doing this all along. You know, now that they can hit DoorDash and food can just show up at their door. But the, uh, the, the, the custom, the normalization of men dominating the workforce came because that's what was required. Yes. And it, it, it's not because we said, oh, I'm going to be sexist. You stay at home, baby. I'm going to go out here and fight these Indians. That wasn't sexism. That was men being men. I completely agree. And so <laughs> we got to quit apologizing to women and quit acting like, uh, you know, women have the same leadership capacity that we do. Here's the true understanding in nature, and this is the time we're living in right now where things are very dangerous, and if you're going to take bold stances, you got to be basically willing to die because the people that created this freedom for us, they were willing to die. Men take bullets. Women don't. Well, well let me float a theory. Yeah. Um, I think women are going batshit fucking crazy. They're really going nuts in the last just few years. Like... When I turn on the TV and I see depictions of women pulling down pictures of kidnapped kids that Hamas took and see them screaming on college campuses, that is something I formerly would have never seen before. I see, physic I see women physically fighting on airplanes. Like I've said it a few times, but you did not see women acting crazy when I was a kid. You know, there was occasional Aunt Esther or some TV character who would hit you with her purse or something. That was about the extent of it. The notion that 80% of the people that are tearing down the pictures of the abducted kids that Hamas took, 80% of them are women is nuts. And when you think about the women who are in politics, many of them, the squad, you know, they're up there crying. They're getting hysterical. Like, we've gone way beyond policy. You guys are just banshees who have sheared your lug nuts off and are going insane in front of a microphone. And, by the way, with no sense of their environment. You know, like Rashida Tlaib, and they're up there. They're going, this is a their hands are flying around, tears, spittle shooting out of their mouth. Like, bitch, reel it in. You're in front of Congress. You know what I mean? Like, let's go. Let's have a little decorum here. They've gone nuts. We've told them nobody's their boss. Nobody can tell them what to do. Everyone owes them. They're all oppressed. We weaponized them. And we pushed them out in the streets. We told them they didn't need men. We told them, just go marry a vibrator. You don't need kids. The earth's going to end in eight years anyway. And they've all, and now they all have a, a couple of rock star energy drinks or a tall latte in their gullet and they've all been weaponized and they're all hitting the streets and they're all insane and they're all miserable. All the ones on the left are miserable. They just seem like the most, I've never seen a more miserable group in my life. And men have allowed it. Yes. And, and men have basically set up a rule and system where uh, they have all the leverage and power. Because if you say anything, you're sexist, and, and you eliminate yourself. So say you're in corporate America and you're a male leader and you see this craziness from a female employee and you want to call it out, you run the risk of being called sexist and then you can't advance, you won't be promoted up the corporate ladder. You have to be an ally, you have to support all the lunacy and you have to believe that, man, if we could just find a woman CEO this company would shoot through the moon and through the roof. And, and, and then the WEF 
the WEF has World Economic Forum has incentivized this through ESG that, you know, if you want this money to rain down on you from these global entities or whatever, there's this ESG, the diversity, actually inclusion quota systems that you have to meet. And so it, it, I worked in corporate television where executives, uh, their bonuses were tied to how many women, how many black people, how many lesbians uh, and, and gay people, LGBTQ, did you promote? You, you, you're incentivized. Your bonuses are tied to that. They're not making decisions based on merit. And, and men in their right mind want to be in a merit-based system because we like to compete. Mm-hmm. And, and, but they're remo- they've removed merit. Adam, you, look at television and what we call successful on TV now. You don't need TV ratings. You don't have to draw an audience to be considered successful. You have to have the right message. And and they've thrown – I watched it in the sports media world. Guys are drawing 150,000 viewers, and they're defining that as super successful. And that guy – man, he's averaging 150,000 viewers. Let's pay him $8 million a year. I lived in a time where you would get canceled for – that type of rating. And I know there's cord cutting and all that other stuff, but the system is rigged to remove merit. They've printed so much money. They can overpay all of these influencers for mediocre results. It's men have to stop apologizing to fix. Now, ever listen, uh, ultimately just like what could have happened with COVID is it was on us. I mean, you can blame the governor, you can blame the mayor. You know, I'm from California. They bulldozed the skate parks at the beaches and cut down the volleyball nets. But ultimately, it was us. The day they closed the beach, we all should have declared a beach day and headed to the beach. You know, I say this <clears throat> sadly all the time, but in, uh, in Los Angeles, a couple of years before they had like the million woman march and a million women showed up. I don't even know what the fuck they wanted. I don't think they know. I think if you would have stopped the average woman who was in the march and ask them, what is it that you want? What are you marching for? I don't think they'd have an answer, but million people showed up. They tried in Los Angeles in the, uh, in the heights of COVID to do a freedom rally we're like they were going to go downtown LA. I think uh, Dennis Prager, our own Dennis Prager, out here in the Daily Wire. I think he showed up. They got like eighty people. It's our fault. It's us. We did it to ourselves. We should have stepped up. Everyone who's called a racist should tell everyone to fuck off. Everyone who's t- called a sexist should tell everyone to fuck off. Like this is all on us. And I think we kind of hope that LeBron James or the Obamas, or even Biden, who said, you know, I'm running, you know, Uncle Joe right down the center, just got up there and starts calling this nation racist every time they put a microphone close to his face. I think we thought they were going to do something naively. We thought, let me uh, speak for Whitey here for a second. (laughs) We thought once we voted Obama in, that would be it. That was our thing. We're like, once we get a black president, then that's the yardstick that you yeah. measure a society. I mean, it, it's funny because it, it was, we used to use it as sort of a metaphor to not living in a racist society. Once we vote in our first black president, that's when it's over. That's when racism is over. He does two terms and it's much worse now than it ever was. And here's a theory. I believe that the race hustlers after voting in a black president for two terms, they triple down. They go, now we really have our work cut out for us. And that's why they all went into overdrive. There was much less talk about race during Obama's terms than there are now. We really kicked it into overdrive. Well, it, it, now Obama's second term, he gets reelected in 2012, I believe in, what year was uh, was Trayvon Martin 2012? Yeah, Trayvon yeah, Martin so, is 2012, yeah. and that started Black Lives Matter. And so their end game, 
people think, and this is what makes me a target or whatever, because I'm trying to say this isn't about race. We're not in a racial struggle. We're in a battle of the sexes. This is about the matriarchy and taking down the patriarchy. And this is about a group of people, women, who I'm not criticizing, but this is in their nature. They will trade freedom for safety. That's that's, And they're supposed to. Yes. Their womb is so important to society. You know, uh, again, you can take one dick and replenish the whole planet. You, you, you need a lot of wombs to replenish the planet. Women and their womb is very worthy of protection, so I get why they're wired that way. And that's why men are supposed to lead society because, again, we're risk takers. We will sacrifice our safety for freedom. They won't. And, and, but they've used this racial thing to like, hey, hey, you guys, you're up. Men, don't wake up. You're, you're pitted in some kind of racial war. Al Sharpton's out to get you, and Donald Trump, if you're black, Donald Trump's out to get you. And go look at that. And, and what's really going on is the destruction of the patriarchy. And, and what I think, so, and I don't know where you are in, in, if you have a faith belief or, or whatever, but it's, that's why those of us that do are strong Christians and believers, like, this is spiritual. This is a battle of good versus evil. This is about the natural order. Are men going to be leaders? I don't, there's no proof in the history of society about a matriarchal society being successful. It's never happened. It never will. I say to people, and I'm sorry if I, I sound politically incorrect, I say to people, you want the matriarchy? Go look at American blacks. We're dominated by the matriarchy. You want that? You, you want your kids not achieving academically? Out all at night? Uh, no male supervision? Achieve? Go ahead. Go with the matriarchy because that's what it looks like. And that's what's happening because we got people now, even in marriages, that it's still a matriarchal marriage well, where the men have been <clears> silenced. <throat> You're right. It, it's interesting. It's it's this is fascinating. I'm glad we brought you in. Um, I've been kicking around this idea for some some time now, what you're speaking of, you know, but just around the edges yeah. of it. Like, I've not really drilled down on it. <clears throat> Everyone gets mad at me, but I call it chick think and versus male think. And people go, well, you're a douche. And I go, well, no, listen, Gavin Newsom thinks like a chick, you know, at, and, and so does Lori Lightfoot. So like does LeBron James. So does LeBron James. It's not really about your genitalia, but there is a kind of chick think, you know, Los Angeles is a chick think city. We have, you know, we had a mayor who was a male. We had a cock and ball mayor. His name was Garcetti, thought like a chick. Now we have a black female, Karen Bass. She thinks like a chick. We just got two chick things. Well, LeBron helped in, install. In a, in, a, in, a row, in a row, right. So it's not about that. You know, Margaret Thatcher thought like a dude, you know, so... I've been drilling down on this idea, and it's funny, Candace Owens was talking about it when I was interviewing her on my show, and I've heard Dennis Prager talk about it a little bit, so it's starting to sort of seep in. But yes, this safety-based approach, which why I got screwed in Los Angeles with COVID is we were chick think, and so we were safety based. I mean, in Los Angeles, I'll give you like perfect chick thing. First off, we had Barbara Ferrer, who was our health minister or whatever, 100%, not only chick think, but crazy gypsy chick think. We had Garcetti, we had Newsom. We were steeped in chick think, right? Safety first. And so what they would do is they'd come out with some sort of color coded safety board, you know, where they'd go, well, we're in the red zone right now because that means two infections for every 10 million people. Now, if we can get into the yellow zone, that'll mean one infection for every 10 million people, but we'll reopen the schools and the beaches when we get to the green zone. And there is no green zone. There's no way to achieve this safety board that you and your crazy chick think brain have achieved. Now, 
the people that own the businesses, the people that have to go to work, the people that earn a living are going, ho, 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 we can't sit home, not earn. You know, the wheels of society need to turn. But here's an idea for you. I think a lot of this, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, a lot of this is connected to money being invisible. Because money, first off, it used to be pelts. You'd have to leave the house. There was no COVID stay home. You got to go collect some pelts, you know what I mean? And then it became ingots and gold and something tangible. Then it became dollar bills and coins and things of that nature. It's Apple Pay now. It's invisible. You know, I sit, I would sit in my house during COVID. You know, my kids, they're teenagers. You know, they go, I go, I'm going to Houston. I'm doing shows. Where are you going? Where are you going? Why are you going anywhere? I go, I got to go out. I got to make money. You got to make money. Come on, COVID's out there. Hang out. I go, <laughs> I got to pay the bills. They go, we pay the bills. It's in the phone. The phone pays the bills. It's invisible. When you return in the day, when you got back, because you, in back of the day, you worked at a mine or a mill or something, a big factory, right? The guys would come home, they'd be covered in soot and sweat and dust if they came home at all. I mean, you know, there could have been a collapse at the mine and Gary never came home. You'd come home covered that, you'd drop your lunch pail when you walked in, you'd take your boots off at the door and there was a meal waiting for you. Why? Because you went to work, you earned money. Now you go to some cubicle somewhere, sit in some air conditioning, have a direct deposit. Nothing's tangible anymore. So therefore, I don't owe you. It's my phone. You know, my kids don't think I pay for everything. They think Apple pays for everything. You're, you're talking a little bit about, and, and there's truth to what you're saying. I don't fully agree or I don't think it's at the root level because what you're talking about, like dad would come home from work and doing all that hard work and there would be a meal because it would be an expression of gratitude from yes. his wife and his kids. Daddy's home. And right. He done went out and took care of us today. Right. And kids greet him at the door. Mama's got a meal. There was gratitude. And and so and and I don't I don't know your audience. All I can do is just tell you what I truly believe. The lack of gratitude now because we're so disconnected from religious faith and we so don't understand our history in terms of how did these people come over here and settle this country, conquer the Native Americans, and create the freest place on earth? And they did it because they had this religious faith and they didn't care, or they, did, they cared a lot less about safety. They were good with dying because right. they felt like, I'm going to be good in the afterlife. If you go read the lyrics of the Battle Hymn of Republic and what these guys were saying during the Civil War, white guys, mostly in the, in the Union Army, singing the Battle Hymn of Republic, the lyrics actually say that, that they are willing to die so that their fellow man can live free. And, and so that was white guys. And, and again, the Civil War was about more than just slavery, but it was primarily about slavery. And, and they were saying, my Christian faith, I'm willing to die because I want to be on the right side of God and I want to create this freedom that God's going to judge me on. We've Go back, let's move, remove the Civil War. Go back to the roughnecks that built all the skyscrapers. I think they say one out of every four of them in the 1920s, 1910s, whenever these things were being built, fell to their death or suffered some kind of severe injury. Men were good with dying because they knew and believed there was an afterlife and there was something better. So they would take these risks. Look at where we're at now, now that the matriarchy is in control and now that we're removed from religious faith and we're a secular society. You and I, Adam, are both old enough to remember when we were kids, there was a guy named Evil Knievel and we'd watch him do crazy things on Saturday, wide world of sports. He'd go out and take risks, risk death, and it was fun. That's what men did. We, we did foolish things. Well, not only would evil do it himself, but he inspired hundreds of thousands of backyard evil Knievels. Because after watching him, 
on Wide World of Sports, I'd go outside and announce to my friends, I'm going ramp to ramp. Yes. We're building a ramp. And we build ramps. Puffy bikes. Build up know. ramps in our front yards and go up. And, and then the difference between men and women. It wasn't enough for your friends to stand around and watch you jump your huffy. They had to lay down. They had to lay down yeah. so you could clear them uh, on your huffy. So now look at what we're doing to the NFL and football. Everything is about safety. Every rule is let's take all the risk, as much risk as we can, out of football. We don't want young boys doing what their forefathers did. We've we, There's no requirement of military service or anything. Now. There's no rite of passage for male masculinity yes. and creating that. No, uh, it's, we've ruined it. Now, so, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the problem. I was sort of the root of the problem, which is, because I've dealt with this for a long time, because I sat next to Dr. Drew, I would do Loveline radio in the 90s, you know? And there was a, it was a popular belief that women and the feminine route was sort of the future of ev evolving as a nation. So there was a very popular thought that's, it's been around for, you know, 30 years now. And Dr. Drew was a, was a proponent of it, which, and I don't really blame them. So they basically said like, what is society and, and, and what are men and what are women? And, and while men are fighting and bashing each other over the head with battle axes and raping women and pillaging, and that was sort of males and, and females were, you know, talk it out, sit down, have a cup of tea kind of thing. So we sort of figured that as we evolved, from those guys, those uh, those hordes and the, and the, the marauding uh, Vikings and people like that, that 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 the evolution was the feminine route, and and started saying, you know, if we just had more female leaders, we wouldn't have war. You know what I mean? If we could elect more women into positions of power, if women were CEOs of companies and senators and congressmen and women, they. That would be the future. So, that would be evolution. So Dr. Drew would say we need to get more women into the, these positions. And it was sort of understood mathematically, like, all right, well, that is the direction we should go for a more peaceful, understanding society. And so we've already have in America like 30, 40 million lab rats for Dr. Drew's theory. Yes. And they're called American black people. Yes. And women are in control of black culture, the matriarchy. Is there more peace in the uh, black community? Let me check my phone <laughs> now. Are, are the Bloods and Crips, have they reached a, a peace accord? No, no. Because like, of the female it, it, it's, it's, it's clearly, it's the worst plan ever. There's no results. Everything seems to be getting worse. We're in still going to be men. Now we've got the emotion of women because that—that's our culture is very emotional. Don't, don't you disrespect me? Disrespect mm -hmm. this? I've been dis. Blah blah. You got you. You still got the physicality of men. Now you've injected them with the emotion of women, and now you have uncontrolled violence. No, it's 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 crazy. You see some of the videos. And somebody, and I, it's uncanny to me. Like, I can't get over some of these videos and some of these beatdowns in the streets and stuff. But the part that I find uncanny that I can't wrap my mind around is there's some guy and he's standing there and he doesn't know the other guy, whatever, and then somehow he's disrespected. Could be the teacher, the janitor, the school or whatever. And the young black man starts beating on the guy. And he starts beating on the guy. And it's a, now... You hit him once and he went down. Fight over, old school in my world. But then they jump on top of the guy and they're still beating him. But the part that I find eerie, really like almost haunting, is at some point some bystander grabs the guy who's just beating the guy's lifeless corpse on the ground over and over again and starts to pull him off. And as they're pulling him off, he's attempting to kick the guy. And I'm like... Where did this come from? You didn't know the guy 30 seconds beforehand. Now you're being pulled off him and you're literally attempting to kick him as you're being pulled off. That does not bode well for our society. That is scary to me. And it's, 
in all different. But you're it, you're right in that it's the sort of physicality of a male and the mentality of a woman. The whole thing about disrespect that I've talked about it nonstop because that that you'll hear black men ain't nobody gonna disrespect me disrespect disrespect and and people don't realize this but in the 1800s I, I there was a black newspaper that coined the frame it was a religious newspaper coins the phrase sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never harm me and and that was black people at that time w were so religious and so like Man, you can't hurt me with words. And now, because of this whole, the last 60, 70 years of this whole feminist movement and this whole government and the breakup of the black family, now words, you know, hit like a sledgehammer in the black community and everybody's running around making sure no one disrespects them. And and, and I, I sat there and I, I've told the story many times. Uh, I was down in Miami, 15 16 years ago at some pool party on top of a hotel. I was with Dan Levitard. Dan Levitard and I were friends at that time. And some Cuban woman got all up in my face and was hitting me with the N word every other. And, really? And, yeah. I, yeah, it was crazy. And, and I mean, I just looked at her like this for, and this had to go on for maybe five minutes. And these guys, when she left and was over there, my God, how, how come you didn't react? That woman looks like a fool. What, 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 should I join her? She's an idiot. She, she, I don't know her. Doesn't matter to me. It, it's nothing. And and that's the mentality of a pro. And again, I'm I'm far from perfect, but that's the mentality of a properly functioning man. It's like, I'm like some words. I can just give a f, f less. Why, I I. I think about this all the time because I believe it's so destructive that we're convincing especially young black men that we live in a systemically racist society and there's a target on their back and I, it drives me nuts when Joe Biden makes these speeches and also I and I do really mean this and I've said to a few black friends does it bother you like when when Joe Biden gives a speech, I always get back to this one where he's talking about baggage handling fees or something, extra add-ons or something. Obviously, he never makes sense when he talks. I don't know what he, <clears throat> I don't even know what he's talking about, but he says this disproportionately affects poor people and people of color, which is you now have a separate group. You're disproportionately affected by baggage handling fees even Jay-Z and Beyonce are, because you're not even in the group of poor people. You're now poor people and, as if the airline knows when you check in online what color you are somehow. But I would find it wildly insulting as a black person if, if, if old white people just kept saying, these people can't show IDs when they vote because it's a bridge too far and baggage handling fees disproportionately affect. Like, we built this entire edifice around saying I can't get along or society hates me or I'm not capable of doing basic things. It, it, it is insulting, but it's a brilliant strategy. Oh, it, it, it it's works. a brilliant strategy because what it does is they can sell any, and it, just the, the group that used to have the reputation as the most homophobic black people have now been, they package the LGBTQ agenda through blackness because again they'll say oh man the trans community and the violence they suffer and we know this disproportionately affects black people yes, and I'm so sure. now as a black person you feel like well i gotta go run out here and defend the transphobic community and i sit there and go well hold on i as a christian i have to argue the insanity of transgenderism and that's what I'm going to do because it is insane if you got a bat and balls you're not a woman you got a vagina you're not a man period end of story that's one of the beautiful things I saw in this lady ballers I just watched the Daily Wires deal and Jeremy Boeing gives this great explanation at the end of any anyway it's just the ins they can package all of their insanity in this racial beard and then dare Adam Carolla 
to question it. Well, you're a racist. Dare Jason Whitlock to question it. Oh, you're a sellout. Uh, and, and so they silence anybody from questioning any of the insanity that they're pushing. And and I'm looking at black people that friends of mine, they're like, man, how did this transgender, how did the LGBTQ thing become our identity? And this guy's like, guys, I've been telling you for 10 years what they're doing. You, you just won't believe me. And it, it, it's at some point we have to stand up and say enough is enough. And as men, black, white, whatever, we got to stop apologizing. The things that we did here in America, 1700s all the way through. And I'm not saying there weren't mist- that slavery wasn't a mistake, but slavery was a global phenomenon, and we fought a war to end it. And, and people sacrificed their lives to end it. And then we, on top of that, then we created the freest place in the planet, the safest place on the planet for black people. Let's quit apologizing. Let's fill ourselves with the gratitude of like, holy cow, George Washington, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln. Man, hats off to those guys. Look at me. I went from a one-bedroom, 400-square-foot apartment with me and my dad in 1984 to uh, living in uh, Westwood on the Wilshire Boulevard, one of the richest zip codes in all of America. There's no other place on the planet I could have done that. Um, So it worries me that, you know, obviously the tastemakers, the LeBrons and the Obamas and stuff, it... And, and Biden, you know, it saddens me that they're in on the hustle and doing so much damage. But also, it rolls deeper than that. Like you take the whole George Floyd Chauvin trial and everything, and the FBI getting involved, and uh, coroner's reports being put aside with new coroner reports being like, now we're getting on a, a federal governmental level, which with the race hustle, which is kind of frightening as a as a citizen. It's also frightening to know that depending on the race of the person, of the perpetrator, the suspect, or the whomever you encounter as a police officer, especially if you're white, certainly if you're white, that that could mean the end of your freedom and possibly your life just based on the hustle. Uh, and I know uh, Chauvin obviously recently stabbed 22 times in prison. I know there's a lot of talk about the guy who stabbed him was FBI or something like the now. And here's the problem with the tinfoil hats. Um, They're no longer tinfoil hatters because after what we saw with COVID, after what we saw with the COVID origins, after what we've saw with the, the WHO and the CDC, uh, vaccines, uh, efficacy, um, the Hunter Biden laptop and the 51 experts that signed off saying it had all the earmarks of Russian collusion. Uh, you're no longer a conspiracy theorist anymore. If you think, you know, January 6th, you know, how many FBI assets and CIA after how many federal government people were on that property wearing MAGA hats rousing up the crowd, storming the Capitol. How many? Well, some. Now, I I used to think none. Now, you know, there was a whole, there was a plot to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Turned out to be mostly FBI guys in the group of of conspirators who who were going to kidnap her. So I no longer believe the government when, when they talk and this Chauvin trial is now getting filed under that for me it certainly the 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 chauvin trial was a hoax but but everything you're talking about is about a culture that values safety over freedom over uh free speech over your right to own guns and so there are going to be incredible consequences that we're already experiencing but but are just going to keep multiplying and multiplying. And I'll, I'll give you an example how the Derek Chauvin deal and all this other anti-police deal. So in these major cities, 
uh, they've lost in Minneapolis. They lost maybe 30 percent of their police force. They've had to lower the hiring standards in order to fill back up their police force. And this is going on right here in Nashville. We have this problem. I live in downtown Nashville by choice. I, I lived in Westwood out in L.A., but I also lived in downtown L.A. Uh, for a time. I like to live in the city. I just bought a home last week because I'm evacuating downtown. Because Nashville. Nashville, because I know what's happening to uh, law enforcement there. Uh, you know, I, I live in a high rise right now, 7,000 a month. Uh, on my street, regular shootings, because I live in the little party area or whatever, but regular shootings on my street because there's a hip hop club in one of these little areas. And it's like the police force standards are going down. I'm going to move out to the suburbs where they can still have high standards for the police force and and I'm not going to be living in a war zone anymore and it's I you know I feel like a wimp but it it's I it's the only rational choice I think I can make at this point and so everybody that's going to be left in these cities are are going to be dealing with a police force with lower qualifications and more corruption and it's just going to be more unsafe in these major cities. Black people are going to pay the consequences for that uh, because people with means and others are going to move out. And, and you're going to be left with one of the most corrupt the police departments. You, you know, it'll be like the blood. It, that was the thing about the uh, Chauvin trial or the George Floyd deal. I, I don't know if you've seen the fall of Minneapolis, but. The woman pointed the out the documentary. The documentary, The Fall of Minneapolis. The woman pointed out that at George Floyd's trial, the first minister to speak and to welcome in the audience shouted out the Bloods, the Vice Lords, and the Gangster Disciples. That was one, probably within the first ten words of the George Floyd ceremony. I want to thank the Bloods, the Gangster Disciples on the South Side, and the Vice Lords or Blah blah blah. That that's the gangs, the criminals are running things in major cities. Yeah, I I don't. Again, I mean, I'll well we'll get into it. We have to take a quick break. Fearless with Jason Whitlock is the name of the podcast. If you like what you're hearing, it's available on Blaze TV, YouTube, wherever you get finer podcasts. You can shoot him a tweet at Whitlock Jason as well. Take a quick break. We'll get more into this, and I got some sports questions as well, and we'll do that right after this. I want to thank O'Reilly for this incredible partnership over the years. We really appreciate it. You make it all possible. And remember, the O'Reilly Auto Parts Holiday Gift Guide is here. So if you're struggling to find gifts, they have something for everyone with gifts starting under $10. They've got deals for the mechanic on your list. Save on work lights, tools, and more to help those who like to do it themselves. Choose from great gift ideas to help someone make their car look its best inside and out. And save on cleaning supplies like washing and drying cloths, floor mats, and steering wheel covers. They've got it all. The Holiday Gift Guide also has emergency supplies to keep your loved ones safe. Save now on tire inflators and super start 12-foot jumper cables. The professional parts people will help you pick out the perfect gift for that hard-to-find person on your Christmas shopping list. Stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts or shop O'ReillyAuto.com. Back with Jason Whitlock podcast. Fearless with Jason Whitlock as well. Yeah, I can't figure out where the upside is like the the truest thing trump ever said and i know i love de niro when de niro gets up there like he's lied thirty thousand times i love the people that are just <laughs> keeping a tally of his thirty thousand lies um but the truest thing he ever said is when he said to the black community what do you got to lose and everyone jumped on him like how dare you well first off he meant it and it was true and I know a, a, a larger group is breaking off of the black community and starting to think we can't keep 
just voting and re-voting the way we've been voting and going down this path because we're now we're now coming on to 50 years and the inner city is not doing any better than it than it was it's doing worse so you know now they start to say that you know maybe trump's up to 18 percent or 20 percent with the black males especially now it is interesting that black women are never going there and you speak to the patriarchy versus the matriarchy right yeah black males at some point are going well maybe we should do a, go a little different direction. The women, black females, who are more emotionally based, aren't letting it. And they're getting all go. kinds of goodies. <clears throat> Katanji Brown Jackson's on the Supreme Court. She can't say what a woman is. You know, Kamala Harris, whether she's whatever race she is, but you know, she slept her way to the vice presidency. Black women, <laughs> I can do that. Is what, is what they're, so they're getting little trinkets. You know, Stacey yeah. Abrams can't balance her checkbook. Or her diet, and she's a superstar uh, in the Democrat Party. You know, I don't blame black women. that They're getting goodies for taking the deal. Right. But men are starting to break off. and I'll be interested. They haven't been put to the test yet. I hear a lot of guys talking, and I'm hopeful. But I, I don't think Joe Biden's going to run for president. I think Michelle Obama is. Yes. And then that's when we're going to find out. If, if black men are going to stand tall or not. Well, now, that's interesting um, because uh, I've heard that a few times. And I've, I've talked to people. One of them's in the room. His name is Mike. Thinks he knows everything. He goes, oh, no, you know, impossible. I go, listen, I, I, I spoke to Ted Cruz, you know, the other day on this show. And Ted Cruz thinks they're going to parachute in Michelle Obama. And Mike's like, no, oh, please. He's just not. He's flapping his gums. I go, well, he's a smart guy, and that's what he thinks. Jason Whitlock's a smart guy, Mike, and he thinks that. What? Joel Gilbert, <laughs> you guys know him? Have you guys had Joel Gilbert on? He, no. He, he did a documentary, Michelle Obama 24. You should watch it, that this has been in the works for a, a long time. Mm. Well, let's, you know, I, I would just say, Let's let's do some math and 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 I like to kind of go process of elimination. Um, so the Democrats want to win, and and I think and I think you could say the same for Republicans, but maybe more so with the Democrats. I think in terms of what they will do to win, I think the answer is anything, and. I I really feel like I was talking to Dr. Drew about this when we were on our podcast, I think, but you know, Obama did eight years, then Trump did four years. Now Biden will do four years. And you know, I think Republicans, at least in the past, were sort of agnostic to some degree in that, you know, I remember when Obama was voted in and I'm like, well, I, I disagree with a lot of his policies, but he seems like a cool dude and yeah, good, good for him. Good for the country. So what, you know, life goes on. You know what I mean? I feel like the, the Democrats have a kind of bizarre desperation. Like if Donald Trump, he's going to open gulags, he's going to lock you down. He's going to take away your, you know, he's going to round up black people and throw them in the grand Canyon. You know, like they really have a bizarre fervor about it, which means we can do anything. It, uh, desperate times, desperate measures. We are the French resistance. That is Hitler, and we can do whatever we want. Like they become animated and desperate. So we at least have the point where nothing is off the table for the Democrats. Um, then you go Joe Biden. Well, he's incumbent, his health is failing, and Every day that goes by, there's a new chapter on the Hunter Biden thing and the corruption thing and the connections to him. Now, it's comical. I was just listening to Joy Reid say, still nothing. There's no connection between Hunter and his dad. And it's like, boy, Joy, Joy are you doing news, by the way? Could you go out and collect some data? There's receipts coming in every day, bank records, emails, you know, it's, it's that. This thing is much bigger than 
anyone ever thought a few years ago, and it's just going to keep going. And I think he's, I think Biden's done. All right, now we have Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala Harris is, they hurt the cause quite a bit because they basically said, it's like saying we need the first person of color to be a quarterback in the NFL, and that guy goes 0-16. Okay, you had your first black quarterback, but what message did it send? You know, I mean, you actually move, you set the cause back because you go, we need a female and she needs to be black and she's horrible. So now everyone goes, oh, what did we accomplish? I don't know. I think you hurt the cause now. So she's, I mean, she's an imbecile. There's something wrong with her. Okay. Or she's not bright or whatever she is. She's not electable. Now we go to- Peter Principle is what Kamala is. She's just been promoted well past her competence. Right. So now we go with... Uh, Servicing Willie Brown was her <laughs> level of competence. Now we go to Gavin Newsom. And I just don't think that West Coast elite shit's going to fly in the middle of the country. I do agree with Mike August on that one. So, you know, where do we go? What's the bench? Who's, who's the bench? And, and if you got to win and it doesn't really matter then yeah, maybe you parachute in Michelle. Yeah, I don't even think it's a maybe. I think it's the plan. Because again, the, the plan, and this is where Trump, he, he blew up their, what, 2016 plan of Hillary Clinton and the matriarchy and on full display. And so they run Biden in 2020 because like, well, couldn't get it done. We A stopgap measure and we just got to, Eliminate Trump was the only goal of 2020. Now we're back to how do we install the matriarchy? And Michelle Obama is the route to go because, and and this is where I would ask for a, a tiny bit of empathy for black men. Heterosexual black men, their sex life is dependent upon uh, making sure they're, the black woman isn't angry with them about politics. Mm. Uh, and so th- this is like a different pressure that you guys don't experience is that, because again, I know guys that like uh, lied to their wife about who they voted for uh-huh. because they just wanted to keep peace in the house or even guys that voted for Biden just to keep peace in their house. Right. And and it is that critical of an issue and and they and they they know it. They know that the black woman can control the black man through access to her vagina and you're talking about making some real a, a major sacrifice for most black men and and it's it's something that you guys don't have that level of pressure. Uh, to where your whole social life, sex life is dependent upon supporting the Democrat well, that's Party. That's a good point. That is my white privilege. Yes. I've, yes. I've said it many times. I mean, not as it pertains to sex, jokingly. But I said the real white privilege is not being expected to act this way or do that way. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? And I don't have to defend Ted Nugent if he does something. You yeah. know, I don't have to defend white people. I don't have to, I, I can, there's plenty of white people. Look, I'm white. Joe Biden's white. I hate Joe Biden. I think he's a fucking idiot and a race hustler. Yeah. Okay, I said it. That's we don't my have white that freedom. Privilege. We don't have that freedom. You no. don't have that freedom. Yeah. I know, and I, I never really th- thought about that, but the ult- that is the ultimate freedom. It's not being handed things. It's being able to do whatever we want. And not having to worry about it and associate with whoever we want. And so for, for, for me, just as a career, by not hopping on uh, the Democrat agenda, again, I'm not welcome in corporate sports media. Right. I, I'm, I'm just, that's done. It's over. I made a calculated choice. I'm going to stand on what I believe in. And so I'm done with corporate media. You, you My friends and people that know me well would say, yeah, and you basically said, I'm done with black women. I'll date white women or Latino women. I'm just, because I'm not playing that game. And, you know, there's some truth to that. And and it's just, it's high risk. I mean, you know, 
I, I tell stories all the time, but it's like I'm telling you, black women want to be in the leadership, in the driver's seat, so much, and they they put you in jeopardy. A lot of times, people don't understand. Like, there's a lot of brothers sitting in jail because their black woman wrote a check uh, that got them in trouble, and and you know she she agitated a fight. She did. It, it, You're not saying physically wrote a check, but you're saying, you're saying, yeah, I'm okay. I'll give you an example. Caused yeah. I'll problem. give you an example. I'm, I'm cause you can write a bad check. Yeah. Yeah. You can, but I, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Cause I've always been this way when I get pulled over by the police, cause I'm a speeder, you know, it's my driver's license registration is hanging out the window before they even get out of their car. Mm -hmm. and yes, sir. No, sir. I just want this to be over as quick as possible. But woman I'm dating black woman, I'm pulled over. She leans across me from the pack. Why the hell you pull us over? What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Right. And I looked at her like, are you crazy? I mean, but that's the kind of. You're going to get you shot. Yes. Right. Or just, now I'm going to get a ticket. There was a good right. chance I'm mm -hmm. going to be so nice to the guy. Right. He's going, because I, I, I mean, I will, man, I got pulled over by a racist cop in L.A. And I killed this dude with so much kindness, just pounded. He was talking crazy to me, and I was like, no, sir, you got me all wrong, blah, blah, blah. Gave me a warning, let me go. Yes. It uh, listen, <laughs> I used to teach traffic school. <laughs> the only advice to getting out of a ticket is kissing ass. Yes. And, and then people go, why should I? It's like, why should you? There's 281 bucks that says why you should yeah. kiss this guy's ass for 40 seconds. And not getting shot, depending yeah. on how far you want to go. I just don't want that. I want it over as soon as possible so I can go along my way. I got stuff to do. Right. <laughs> so this is an interesting phenomenon, which is black women are definitely staying Democrat. And black men have to, and not only they have to deal with black women and trying to get laid, but they got to deal with the 80% of black men who they're hanging around with, with too. So that's Th that's a, a little easier. But again, let's say you go to church and you go to a black church. Everybody in the congregation, or if they know that you are conservative, they're looking at you sideways. Your social circles, like the stuff I used to nightclubs. I, I'm relatively well known or whatever. But but I used to be able to socialize wherever I wanted. My, my dad owned a bar in the inner city my whole life. It was Masterpiece Lounge, my favorite place on earth. I would still go to the Masterpiece, but my dad's passed. But anyway, it's like going into all black social environments where everybody's a hardcore leftist and everybody is making judgments on people based off their politics rather than, oh, is this a good person? Is this a good tipper? Is this someone that's gonna be polite to me? It's like, no, does this guy love Barack Obama and the Democrat Party? Again, it, it it makes you hesitant to socialize in environments that you used to socialize in all the time before everybody made their political identity their front and center. You, you know, you got to just be more careful. And well, I mean, I would say that's akin to what what you're talking about. So it, and you tell me if this rings true. You know, if you want to be a white male out here in Nashville and talk about voting Republican. That's fine. Um, but if you want to operate in Hollywood as a white male who's not down with the leftist agenda, then it is sort of equivalent to being the black male who is down with the same way. Same thing. You don't get invited to the parties anymore. And there's an ostracizing yes. that takes place. And, and it has an impact on your career as well. So it's not a great call. It's, it's, it's not a great angle. It's actually funny. I was out here, uh, attending a wedding of a few years ago and, uh, a, f a female friend of mine who I used to work with in the, in the business was there and she likes me. I like her and we're at this wedding. Maybe she had a couple of drinks and she just kept saying to me, Adam, you have to shut up you have to shut up. And I said, no. And she said, but you have to shut up so you can w weave your way back into Hollywood. And I just kept saying, I'm not interested in shutting up. Um, I don't have 
a faith like you do, which is probably a lot of what empowers you to speak the truth as you see it. Um, I have a sort of faith and oath to being a comedian. Look, I didn't get into comedy to shut up or mince words or think about, you know, lick my finger and figure out which way the wind was blowing. I got into comedy to talk and say what I want to say. And I can't shut up about it. And um, I don't, it, it, it saddens me that so many commentators and comedians and people with voices and microphones choose that route, which is to me a coward's route. Conveniently, I say that, but I think, I think many of them think differently than they, than they speak. I did, a, I did a show last night and when I was done with the show, I do what I always do, the meet and the greet. And uh, I, I stood there and people come by, they're nice, we take a picture, sometimes I buy a book. And uh, this one woman came in and uh, she, Mike said, you want me to take a picture, give me the camera? She said, no picture, no picture. I just want to talk to Adam. And she pulled her phone out and she showed me a bunch of pictures of her and her daughter. And I was like, I don't know what this is. Um, then I realized her daughter has Down syndrome and I made a Down syndrome joke in my act. And she said, uh, you got to pull that joke. And I just said, no, not doing it. And she goes, yeah, but you got to do it because I got a daughter with Down syndrome, which I'm sympathetic to, but you cannot tell me not to make a joke or not to talk about this or not to speak about that. And that's the way, that's the way I feel. I feel about comedy the way you feel about Jesus Christ. So I'm so glad you brought this up because you're the perfect person for me to ask. And, and I say this all the time about Bill Maher. And so I'm asking you the same question I'd love to ask Bill Maher, because obviously he's built a brand anti-religion. And so do, do you all understand that, and I'm not asking you to accept my faith, but do you all understand that a Christian culture created the freedom that allows you the free speech and all of that. It's a and better, uh, listen, I wish everyone was religious, including myself. So secular culture is why you're in, your free speech is in danger. Yeah, we're fucked. Yeah, and because Christian culture. Yes, because we're going down this, this atheist road. Yes. Yes, I 100% agree with you. Well, that, that's awesome. Right, this, next time you talk to Bill Maher, ask him if he, if he recognized that, because I see him like, oh, his eyes are starting to open, and he's going to have to acknowledge as much as he doesn't like religion, that culture was better for comedians and for free speech and for all Americans than secular culture. Oh, I completely concur. I, I would much rather live next door to Christians than atheists, for sure. And every bad idea Love to hear that. comes out of an That's atheist. That's awesome. Thank you. They're horrible. Uh, they're horrible. And their ideas are horrible. And, and... I, 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 so I don't see, first off, I don't get like Bill Maher's an atheist and, uh, you know, Penn Jillette's an atheist. I don't know, there's a couple of famous atheists, you know, and I was always an atheist as well, but I, I, it's only because I grew up in a vacuum of religion, not because I was weaponized. You know, I, I didn't want being an atheist to become its own religion which is what happened with Bill Maher and Pendulette. And guys, I consider those guys friends mm -hmm. and I like them a lot. And I, I think they have very interesting minds, but at some point being an atheist becomes your religion, which seemed to be antithetical to me to being an atheist. Like I, I was an atheist because I didn't want anything, not because I wanted to campaign and go to you know, a church of, of atheists uh, I didn't want that. So I was kind of consistent, which is I'm not religious. By all means, feel free to be religious. And I'm not stupid. I believe in every one of the Ten Commandments. So I'm, a, I'm an atheist, and I'm in California, and when the assholes are talking about tearing down the statue with the Ten Commandments on it in front of the courthouse, I'm like, hey, jack off, stay home. We need those Ten Commandments. That's... The, that's 
That's a grocery list of how to live. And it, it, it transcends religion. I mean, it's like thou shalt not, you know, covet your neighbor's ox or his uh, Rolex. <laughs> it should be updated a little. <laughs> Oxen, Rolexen. The, the point is this. All the things, thou shalt not murder, like all, all the adultery, it's all there. Just follow it. As an atheist, we live in a much better world. And I've always felt that way. That's awesome to hear. And because I've lost so many, because, you know, I used to have a lot of leftist friends and, and still love them to death, but I've, I've lost them. As I have leaned more into my faith, I've lost them. They, they, they're like, oh, Whitlock's, you know, some holy roller. And, and maybe I am, but I, I, I'm still very, very tolerant of people that don't believe the same thing as I do. And it's like, what do you mean? We were friends because we talked about the Chiefs and we talked about sports and we talked about journalism and things like that. I, I could care less, really, you know, that we disagree about religion. I, I could care less. But they seem to care a lot. And you Well, know. They're, first off, their religion is the Democratic Party and yes. the left at this point and then the environment. The environment is their religion. And for some reason, they're they're very much like Hamas that way, which is like you're either you either believe this planet is gonna be over in ten years if you don't stop driving that pickup truck, <laughs> or we're gonna try to kill you. And their version of it, you know, Hamas's version is we're gonna kill you. Their version is we'll just destroy your life. Yes. We'll have you removed from your job at ESPN. We'll take your livelihood away and you'll be ostracized. They are much more religious in that way than you are. You know, Dennis Prager is a very religious Jew. He and I are great friends. He doesn't try to foist his religion upon me. He doesn't judge me for not being a Jew. He's fine with it. Try going to Hollywood and preaching that with one of these crackpots, whether it could be all things COVID, it could be all things global warming, go over there and have a dissenting voice and see how it works out with these zealots. You can't, I mean, again, you got to, and to be in the good graces, yeah, yeah, men can get pregnant or, you know, right. some man, you know, we'd be better off if more transgenders were in leadership positions. Like, what's what's the Rachel guy? Who's the admiral that we've installed? Levine. Yeah, is it Rachel Levine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that type. <laughs> That's insanity. We're making ourselves insane. a laughing stock. I, I agree. Like, if, if you're China or yeah. Iran and you see that bizarre shit show of a he she wearing a Salvation Army skirt up there, and I don't you think it's, be laughing your ass off. I think all the diversity, equity, inclusion, like in the military, <laughs> that, that's insane. I yes. don't, I, you know, love but the, the hustle. I mean, you just brought up talking about the Chiefs, so I have to bring up the recent kerfuffle with the nine-year-old boy with the face paint on, which shows me the hustle. You, you know what I mean? Where there's, I think it's depravity. It's a nine-year-old kid oh, well, that they're uh, trying to... It, but, to it's depravity. No, I get it, but, it's, it's, uh, but we're getting back to the French resistance. You know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't matter. There are no Marcus of Queensberry anymore. There are no more rules. We're doing this in the name of this religion and power. And it doesn't matter how many innocent kids we got to throw under the bus or how many innocent cops we got to lock up so they can be shivved in the joint. It doesn't matter anymore. It's, and that's, again, I don't, I don't if you don't want to go here, don't stop Go ahead. Me. But that's why I'm so passionate about pro-life because th this mindset of, you know, life begins once you're outside the womb is is directly connected to and, and I'm trying to explain to people like well, hold on there's all kinds of things you can do for a child while a child is in the womb that will help that child in life if you read to your child while he's in the womb likely to be more smarter more articulate more more well-read 
if 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 the woman takes care of her health and she's in an anxiety free area the, the child is le- likely to be less emotional and all there's all these things you can do for a child inside the womb that affects their life once they're born and and so i i see all of this is connected to like there's no respect for children none with, that's the thread that connects all these guys. And so when I see them trying to cancel a nine-year-old boy, I was like, these guys hate kids. And when I see them thinking it's appropriate for drag queens to come read to your kids in school and, to, and for teachers to start having conversations with your kids at six and seven years old uh, about their sexuality instead of leaving it to the parents, I'm like, these guys hate kids and and I, I, I don't it leaves me at a loss but yeah no I'm, I <laughs> listen I it's it's any anyone can be a martyr for the cause I mean it doesn't it doesn't matter the cause is the hustle and we're running out of real racism and so we're gonna find it wherever under every rock and it's sad, and I, 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 and it's sadder to me that, like you always get back to, more people just need to stand up and go, "This is bullshit. What are you yes. doing? What are you doing here?" Um, I know uh, you got some thoughts about Deion Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> He's sports person of the year, Adam. At f- with a four, four and eight, eight last record. place in the Pac-12. Last place in the Pac-12. Yeah, I like. Dion, I guess. I mean, I used to like to watch him play for sure. And I, I like he's outspoken and so on and so forth. I mean, he seems like a fun and entertaining character for someone he's who's not Jim paying Jones. that close of attention. He's Is Jim it? Jones. Really? He's a cult leader. He's using religion as some little fake marketing ploy. He's not a good guy. On Monday, uh, we had some Colorado football players on mm-hmm. that – explain like what's really going on in Colorado and some of the uh, unethical, mean-spirited practices of Deion Sanders. And so there's what you see in all the videos he's getting sh- having shot, and then there's the real Deion Sanders, and it ain't good. Well, maybe he's a little more Don King in that sense, that he waves the flag and says only in America. Don King loves America. Uh, he does, but he did st- stomp a man to death in St. Louis. S- shit happens, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good note to go out on, Jason. <clears throat> I'm so glad you carved out some time to come down here and. Do I'm my glad show. you invited me. This is all. This was more. I wanted to crack more jokes, but. We got pretty serious. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm up on stage joking all night, and we do a lot of comedy I know, this on the show. I like but to crack jokes. You I, crack uh, them for a I, I do like. I, I, I just think you're a world class thinker, and I really want to hear your ideas. I appreciate it. Good and to share. Fearless with Jason Whitlock. It's available on Blaze TV and uh, YouTube and anywhere else you find uh, finer podcasts as well. Derek Beery, who's a very interesting car expert, who's done a lot of shows and has a lot of thoughts. We're going to go out and see what he brought us and get into it with him, taking it outside the studio, and we'll do that right after this. The O'Reilly Auto Parts Holiday Gift Guide is here. So if you're struggling to find gifts, they have something for everyone with gifts starting under $10. They've got deals for the mechanic on your list. Save on work lights, tools, and more to help those who like to do it themselves. Choose from great gift ideas to help someone make their car look its best inside and out. And save on cleaning supplies like washing and drying cloths, floor mats, and steering wheel covers. They've got it all. The Holiday Gift Guide also has emergency supplies to keep your loved ones safe. Save now on tire inflators and super start 12-foot jumper cables. The professional parts people will help you pick out the perfect gift for that hard-to-find person on your Christmas shopping list. Stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts or shop O'ReillyAuto.com.
All right, well, a little different change of pace for us. Standing in a parking lot, it's raining in Nashville, Tennessee. Derek Beery is here. He's all things automotive. Uh, in the Isles is the name of the podcast presented by O'Reilly Auto Parts. That's available on YouTube. And also TV shows, Roadworthy Rescues. And you can watch that on Motor Trend TV. And it's good to see you. I love a car guy. Sorry about the weather. Oh, it's all right. This is uh, pretty typical. When you plan on a good day, this is what you get. You know? So Derek drove out and met us at the Daily Wire, and we're going to walk around his super truck here, and then it started raining on us. So we hightailed it over to the mall, and we found some covered parking, and we're improvising, but I think it's going to work out. Now, we'll get into the vehicle you brought us, but let's talk about you a little bit and uh, your love of all things automotive. How did it start for you? Uh, you know, it was really at a young age. I get asked this a lot. It's, it's kind of an evolving question, but uh, just a young age, watching my grandparents and my father and my uncles work on old cars. And it really kind of came from the necessity to just repair what you have and figure it out. Yeah. We were way out in the country. There was no parts stores or just run the town quick and get this. So we were cutting, hacking, pulling from this, modifying, pulling from that, making things work. Yeah. And uh, that, that's just where I started was all my first vehicles, all the cars that I like, everything that I grew up with was just necessity to make it run, just get to work or get to school or whatever it was, you know? Yeah, there was something satisfying about and I, I remember those days, it was, like I was poor. I mean, everyone worked on their own cars because they had to. Right. And that's where it started. It was yeah. necessity. It was sort of the difference between early man hunting or now we go to the supermarket. You know what I mean? Right. They didn't hunt because they loved it like Joe Rogan likes it. They hunted to eat to live, you know what I mean? And I could remember working on my trucks and working on my early cars as a necessity, you know? Right. And yeah. going down to O'Reilly or sometimes going down to the junkyard and pulling, pulling something and then bringing it back and making it fit. But there was a kind of a satisfaction in it. Like, I, I don't think enough young people are getting the, you know, try it now satisfaction and having that engine catch. You know right. what I mean? Like when something isn't working, you right. know what I mean? Where they literally, <laughs> a bunch of noise started as soon as we started this thing. But what is cares? that? It sounds like some kind of hydraulic scissor lift or something. It's pretty extreme in, actually. <laughs> in, the, in the background. I have no idea what it is. Does it sound okay, Chris? Fine. We'll keep moving. The, the point is, is there's, a, there's just a satisfaction of the car wouldn't catch, you know, right. just na, 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 right. na. And then at some point you jiggle some stuff around or you blow some compressed air into a carburetor jet or you pull something out, you blow on it or you take a plug <laughs> out and you gap yeah. it or you just clean it under your armpit or something and you go try it now and it catches. Right, all and of a sudden like it a, fires. There's, yeah. a, there's a satisfaction in that that I yeah. feel like these kids with their damn Teslas are missing. Oh, it's, it's, it's completely different. I mean, everything that I ever grew up with, and I'm sure the same with you, is like, we worked for it, we bought it, we worked on it. You had to make a drive, and then you had to make it reliable. And I mean, that, that's just how I grew up is, how cheap can we make this thing run? It probably only work for two, three weeks, and you just discard it and go on to the next vehicle, right. find something else, make that thing run and drive, and you just kept moving through them, you know? I probably changed vehicles more often than I did jeans, actually, growing <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up in a very different environment, and, and this is an interesting subject, and it, and it kind of brings me back to a story that I, I enjoy, because whenever you talk to car guys, and you're a car guy, they always lead with, well, my dad, I watched my dad, my grandpappy, he was wrenching away on a Model mm -hmm. T, or, you know, I, I, I knew Jay Leno when I was a kid, or something, something, you know, but I will say this, I grew up with none of that. My dad didn't own a tool, 
literally not a tool. No one in my family worked on cars, had any aptitude for building or wrenching of any kind. Like, you would, I would defy anybody to find somebody who did less wrenching than my dad. There's, it <laughs> okay. doesn't exist. I, Henry Kissinger just died. I guarantee that guy held a wrench longer than my, my dad, <laughs> and I don't think he ever picked up a wrench. So you were up against it. I was, I was like, I had it in me. And, I, and, it, and it was it was it was sort of crazed. Like I wanted to take things apart. I wanted to turn wrenches, and there were no wrenches, no garages, no tools, no cars. Yeah. Nothing. And it was a weird thing. But the 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 thing that I find interesting about it is, I haven't told this one in a while, but I went out to dinner. I was I was at a Pebble Beach for car weekend for the vintage races and stuff like that. This is 20 years ago. And I was out with a couple of friends, and we're sitting at, the, at dinner, and the waitress came by. She said, you guys in for the car week, you know? We said, yeah. I said, oh, you guys are into cars. And the one guy piped up, and he said, yeah, I was into cars because my dad owned a transmission shop, and he worked on cars. He'd always bring home something interesting, mm -hmm. and I'd ride around, and that's why I'm into cars. And then the other guy said, I'm into cars too because he, my dad was a butcher, but he still liked cars and he brought home some cool stuff. And I, he had a Chevelle when we were a kid and I worked on it. And, and then I said, my dad wasn't into shit, <laughs> cars at all. <laughs> and I'm equally as into yeah. cars as you guys are. Yeah. So I, 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 even though you give praise to your grandpappy and your dad, I feel like it's in, it's just in you. It could be that way. I mean, you're just kind of born with it or you're not, right? And like, my my kids, for example, I've got three three boys. One is hardcore into it. Two of them aren't, which is fine. The one that's into it, he wasn't. I didn't have him in the shop. I didn't right. raise him that way. I that's didn't. I point. didn't force mechanics on him. I didn't say like, "You're helping dad today" or whatever. It was just in his bones, and, I, and I, he I, loves I, it. He does sim racing. He's breaking records on. Uh, 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 NASCAR tracks and stuff like that on sim racing and all this stuff. Right. Like the kid just has it in his DNA, but I didn't force it on him. No, you can't. No. It, it, it's like, look, whether the kid's into ranching or whether the kid's gay, good luck. Right. You know what I mean? You're yeah. not getting it out of them. Yeah. You're not getting it into them. Yeah. You, you just, I brought a preacher over to the house. Yeah. No, no, no. It, as a matter of fact, I, I tend to think they go harder of into whatever direction you're trying to get them out of. So good luck molding the youth of America. Uh, you, you did, I was reading up on the 2.4 hours of mullets. La mullets. La mullets, like it's La, a La, La, La yeah, Ma. It's right. a La Ma kind of spinoff. Yeah. Right, so yeah. they, they had the 24 hours of lemons, yeah. which started as the La Ma sort of knockoff where you, right. I don't know the rules, I don't know, your, your car couldn't be worth more than three grand or whatever, whatever yeah. the 24 hours of lemons, but the Lamolets, how's that work? You know, there's really not any rules, which is, you know, that's a thing in its own, but basically for me, it's just a walk on because the, the track that we show up to, basically you all get this Crown Vic car, they all have a 50 shot of nitrous, they all have a cage and a seat, but the ticker is you can't touch anything. So tire pressure, air filters, oil, transmission, nothing. It's just- So you all get the same car? You get the same car. Uh-huh. Yep. It's a P71 retired cruiser, basically. You can spray paint them, doll them up, do this and that. But what I like about the, the challenge, even though it's not a bunch of, you know, SCCA racers or whatever else, is you really do have to be the best driver. It doesn't matter if they're Someone off the street, someone with experience, an IndyCar driver, a NASCAR driver, a Thunder Truck driver, a stadium driver, we've had all these people in that class. It comes down to, you all have the same car, how can you drive the thing? And that's what I, I really, really like about that competition. Yeah. And um, we've had a lot of fun with it. I've, I've done it for a few years now and it's been a blast. Have you done? Well, I've, uh, we've ran top five for pretty much every race. Um, last race we just did, I finished first in my half. I passed it over to my driver, and uh, we finished sixth as a team. 
uh, we've done pretty good. The hard part is just trying to keep the car together, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, there is something. I mean, I've done the Toyota Grand Prix celebrity race five times, I think. And there's just something about equally prepared cars that yeah. just ups the competition level. It, oh, it just does. Yeah. It, you know, you, you do, I've done some vintage racing um, and there's so many different cars out there that it's really hard to tell how much of it is the car. I mean, the guys that are running up front definitely know how to drive their cars, but I just yeah. mean a lot of it is such a variation in horsepower that it's hard to tell. And even I've done a couple of professional Trans Am races and those, those cars are pretty, you know, there's a lot of parody in those cars, but there's a Mustang over here and there's a Corvette over there and there's a Camaro right. over there and there's a 911 over here. And it's, you know, there's a difference, you right? Know what I mean? but that, you do the Celebrity Grand Prix, everyone's in the exact same car, and you, you pick them randomly, too. You know, they mm -hmm. just put all the numbers in a hat in a helmet, and you just pull one out. So it's total random kind of luck of the draw, but that's what really makes it fun. It is. I mean, that being said, obviously, you have experience with this, but it's like, how many miles does this engine have, or more importantly, hours? What kind of RPM does it turn, and what kind of rear gear does this have thing? Our thing I have because especially on a short track the gear makes such a difference and these p71s had several gears right so it's like maybe it's similar maybe it's not but when i get in a car it's like how many miles how many hours and what rear gear does this thing have because that's how i know how hard or how conservative i need to be with this vehicle i might have it on the stretch i might not have it out of the hole and you got to kind of come up with a game plan on how to race this car to be more effective you know did you, uh, changing gears, did you see that video with the Tesla super truck? Yeah. That was yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's a, and I don't know if it was cooked or not. I, I don't think it was cooked, but it was a Tesla super truck. I mean, the one that's, you know, several years in the making with yeah. the bulletproof glass and famously busted the window at the auto show a few years ago. But they set it up nicely where they had a, the super truck on the quarter mile going against the Porsche 911 and the super truck nipped it at the quarter mile mark, which is damn impressive. Yeah. And then you see at the end, it's hauling a trailer with the same colored 911 <laughs> on the open trailer. So yeah. he literally just did a quarter mile, beat a 911, hauling a trailer with a 911 yeah. on it which is you know you got to you got to tip your cap to Elon for that. The, the torque is crazy on electronic cars. It's, oh my god. It's insane. It's, it's now there's no hesitation. You know? No, it's it's it, for those who kind of don't get it, it's why everyone falls off the back of a golf cart <laughs> especially <laughs> after a few yeah. beers where the guy jumps in and yeah. you, you hit it and it's now. And it's kind of in, it's it's kind of interesting because as much as a lot of gearhead guys take some sort of stand against electric cars, I just got an all electric Audi and I love it. But I'm a gearhead and I got a lot of vintage race cars and I love, you know, gear, you know, wrench it on everything and right. everything. But this right. thing works, you know? Right. But it does teach you throttle control because <laughs> you, you have to feather yeah. it because I, I swear to God, like I was just pulling out, <clears throat> you pull out. If your passenger sitting next to you holding a mug of coffee or something, and you just, you, it'll go all over their sweater. Like, it's even a, on the it's road. Not coffee, like, it's beer. It's, it's beer. beer. Yeah. You got to, and it's not a sweater, it's a hoodie. But either way, you've got, you got to kind of feather it a little bit. Oh, you got to kind of figure it out. Yeah. I also, which I appreciate, but I also notice with the instant torque, in LA, there's tons of Teslas mm -hmm. on the road, tons of Teslas. And I'll see guys at freeway speeds going, you know, 65 miles an hour, making a move. Like, like, like quick, stuffing quick themselves move. in there. Like, yeah, yeah because they've, the, the, the drivers have now realized that they got it. Like, right. like it used to be, if you're at 65, you'd hit it, you know, with your four banger or your six cylinder, 
and the transmission would drop it down a gear, right. and then you'd hear the engine start to spool up, like, Ugh. but it made noise before you even went right. there. These guys are making moves, like they're stuffing themselves into tight spots, which I appreciate. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to have the, I mean, back in the day, it was like, Three sec. You put it to the mat. And you've got three seconds for the quadrajet to open. Right, right. And you got two more seconds for the transmission to kick down. Right. And then you got to figure out your accelerate. It was a 15 second move. Yeah. I and you know. really had to look <laughs> far know. ahead to figure this out. Now it's just like, bam! It's, you can make these moves quickly. It you know? is on demand, and it's kind of a metaphor for life because it's like you used to have to wait and wait till the album came out and then buy the whole album and then listen wait for the song you wanted to come on the radio or whatever it is now it's just like instant satisfaction yep. and gratification like immediately it's like you need you need it when you need it and you need it now exactly and that's what electric cars are and uh you know as soon as they get the range up a little bit not too much, but we need another 100 miles worth of range on those bad boys. Oh, at least, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to, you know, I, you know, you're out in Nashville, but I mean, to make it from L.A. to Vegas or make it up north, you it's know, a long San trip. Francisco. It is, and I, and, I, and I figured it out. I took the electric car to Vegas. Uh, they don't really tell you how the range works. The range, <laughs> the range is... You got 300 miles range if you never get on the highway. If you get on the highway, right. it starts going fast. So you had extension cords running out of single wides and all sorts of stuff. You were vibing people, trying I, to get... I had some range anxiety. Like I yeah. drove the thing out to Willow Springs Racetrack and it said it was you know 110 miles out of town. I was like, well, I got 175 on the range. Oh no, I didn't. Oh yeah. No, yeah. not when you're eating it up on the did. highway. Yeah. Yeah. Not at not at 85 miles yeah. an hour. The other thing about the electric cars is they're so quiet, they're so smooth, and they're so sorted that you're going 90 on the freeway and you don't even know it right like i mean god bless your super truck here but 90 feels like something right in, a, in an old school truck right you hear it car. you feel it yeah. yeah 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 you do not know it in yeah. in those cars but it's like you fly in a commercial jet plane you're going 550 miles an hour you don't feel it yeah. and it's a lot of it is the same thing so what did you bring us today i know it's a dually I know uh, you've definitely breathed on it a lot. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna bring some sort of, uh, you know, something out of the collection or something really cool, but most of what I own doesn't have windshield wipers or weather stripping, so that kind yeah, of Yeah, I know, I've been, listen, I, people <laughs> say to me all the time, you, what do you do with your race cars? I go, I race them. They go, you, but you should drive them on the street. You should have, I go, yeah. you can't drive them on a the street. They don't have signals. Fire right. comes out of the exhaust pipe. <laughs> right. There's no way. They didn't right. have the clearance. I couldn't even make it out of the shop they're in without ruining the air. Exactly. Deck. Right. Yeah. So this. So this is our shop truck. This is kind of our mule. We pull a lot of projects home with this or to the shop. We travel all over the country with this thing. It's an 87 GMC, basically one ton dually, uh, but it's got an 8.1 liter Vortec. It's a newer engine. Basically all that remains of that is the intake. Everything else has been gone through heads, um, pistons, everything But I else. mean, this is uh, hardcore because when we're coming here, they said, well, Derek's gonna bring something cool and then it started raining. Yeah. And then they said, well, he's just gonna bring the shop truck, which is what Mike said. And I was like, oh, the shop truck. So we're gonna drive, I can't walk around a bone stock Silverado right. or Ford F-250. With F a sticker on the door or something. Yeah, yeah, I was like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work, his shop truck. And <laughs> then we saw you pull up in this and I was like, oh, he's hardcore because even the hardest core guys have a normal truck usually right like they just this go is it. <laughs> they go our shop truck is just it's just a it's just a bone stock gmc or ford you know 350 dually or whatever it is yeah. we need air conditioning we need we need an airbag mm -hmm. and we have to have reliability and we can't have it overheat and that's what we drive but 
Not you. No, this is it. This is as new as we get, basically. So we got the 8.1, we got a 4L80, we got 411 rear, one ton rear, airbags, it's got cruise control, air conditioning, heater, Bluetooth, did you, stereo system. Did you go right down to the frame with this thing? No, no, this was a, we call it a cab rebuild. So we left a cab on the frame, but the front clip and the box came off and uh -huh. we did everything else. But it's all pretty cheap, actually. I mean, we pinched pennies building this thing and we put a ton of miles on it. And uh, it's kind of a testament to the old vehicles which I like is I can go down the highway just as fast or just as good as the new 2020 Fords with this with the gooseneck on. And the guy next to me, I'm passing him, is going, what in the world? It's going, right. You know. well, you're like Elon in his super truck. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we'll show you some footage of uh, some donuts and burnouts and fun in the rain, lighting it up with this, with the, with this uh, thing. Were you, what are you thinking about in terms of where we're heading, what's new, what's interesting? Like, you know, there's a lot of good product out there, there these is. days. Yeah. You know, Ford Mustang kicks ass, Chevy Vet kicks ass, you know, Dodge got some interesting stuff. I mean, forget about Porsche and Ferrari and Lamborghini. And, you know, it's just a good time. Like, I, I don't think people fully understood it, but you really got to do this math. Like I graduated high school in 1982 and I'm a car nut, but I have no money and I'm, it's 1982. And I'm looking around going, what do we got? Like I've seen Corvettes go from their heyday, split window, big blocks, side exhaust, Boom, in 1982. To crossfires. Yeah, yeah. like there's nothing. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing out there. Even, even looking back on the day, even the Ferraris of the day, zero to 60, 7.9 seconds or something like that. Yeah. You know, Magnum's car, 911. They've, they've de-stroked everything. So they, have to, they lower the compression on everything to pass smog. And now there's no performance. It's 1982. Man Eater from Hall & Oates is number one on the billboards <laughs> and there's no fucking cars for me to buy and I'm getting depressed. Like I'm going, and, and, and by the way, if, if, when I was born, I'm born in the middle of the 60s. Yeah. Right in the middle of the heyday for muscle cars, looking good. I mean, I'm literally born the year the Shelby Cobra comes out, you right. know? And I'm going, this is good news. And then since my date of birth to the time I graduate high school, it's all downhill uh, in yeah. performance. There's no muscle anymore. It's all junk. Smog is kicked in. Gas is unleaded. And by the way, we're going to be out of it in, yeah. in, in a few years because that's what they were saying in the 80s. Man eaters, number one. And I'm depressed, super depressed. And now I look around and I'm like, they got SUVs that are sub three and a half seconds, you right. know, zero to 60. I yeah. mean, look, there's cars with six seats in it yeah. that are under four seconds, zero to six. They're everybody, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, everyone's got an offering of something with a V8 with 500 plus horsepower and that works, that's quiet, that's reliable. I mean, it's never been a better time if you're, if you're into performance. Right, I mean, it's one of those things like, for when you were growing up, the 80s was terrible. I mean, Ford, Pontiac, Chevy, Dodge, everything. But like you say, it was on just a massive deal. Oh, I mean, there it was, was nothing. Uh, Pontiac <laughs> came out with the Fiero. Right. It's a plastic <laughs> car. Rear engine performance car. With a four banger in it, eventually a six, you know, zero to 60 in eight and a half seconds or something. I mean, it was just, I was depressed. I just bought a... Uh, I call it the Lamborghini. Okay. Okay, it looks like a Countach, but it's made completely of OSB. <laughs> Hang Ori on. Hold on, hold oriented on. strand board for hold those on. who are listening. And uh, the front end is a Fiero 84, and the back end is a 94 Beretta, Chevy Beretta. But the kicker is the back end is actually the front end of the Fiero, and they're grafted together. So the front wheel drive Beretta in the rear of the Fiero is powering 
the Lamborghini. So it's mold, all made of like, I, first off, OSP, quarter inch, three eighths, like it's normally half inch. Well, I mean, I a guess. guy wants to run three quarter inch, let's be honest, but this is half inch. Half it's, inch it's OSP. Yeah, it wasn't treated, doesn't have Thompson or nothing like that. <laughs> and the Beretta was a front wheel drive car. By the way, I got depressed even when front wheel drive cars came out. The idea oh, of yeah. lighten up the front, That's torque when it was steer, over. and yeah. it was over. It, it was, was over. over. My dad had a like a 75 VW Rabbit. And it just sucked. I just hated the front wheel drive. But the Beretta, which is a front wheel drive car, and I didn't even know was a front wheel drive car, uh, has the front and back and is driving it. Right, so like the tie rods and everything is welded together stationary. In the, it's all still there. It's just crudely stick welded by Ray Charles in the back of this car. <laughs> It's not lined right. I mean, you go, you're dog legging. And, down the, and road. the front is the Fiero. It's the Fiero. The Fiero is the car that went to outer space in the last Fast and <laughs> Furious for people. Uh, by the way, I, it's I, a terrible car. I love me some Fast and Furious, but at some point you're jumping the shark. There right. and you're sending a Fiero to outer space, uh. and Vin Diesel's driving down a dam and a Charger, outrunning the water, whatever, whatever it is. I. I do like, you know, there is a renaissance, which is kind of interesting, and, and you're younger than I am, and you may have missed out on some of it, but back in the day, people did their own shit with their cars. Like, mm -hmm. back in the day, when I was a kid in the 70s, we didn't have a lot of camper shells on trucks. We had a lot of homemade <laughs> campers like yeah. guys some of it got nice you know sometimes they're going with like t and g teak you know clear you know look the shipbuilding shit sometimes it was just plywood you mm -hmm. know but like people modified stuff people would take a vw bug i'm from southern california we had baja bugs all over the place vw bugs with the rear clip you know, rear sand on and the brush guard and the stinger exhaust pipe mm -hmm. and the big big jacked up uh, knobby tires and everything on it and it was like it was fun and yeah. people would take like they take like a vw bus and hack the back off and make a flatbed out of it people like made their own gardening trucks and stuff <laughs> you know and yeah. it it, it, it went away for a long time because yeah. they, they started coming out with mini trucks and right. all kinds of trucks. There's a right. van for everything. There's a truck for everything. But people are kind of finding their way back yeah. to putting their hands on stuff. And I, I think that's American and I like it, you know? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun watching the kind of the evolution, like you say. I mean, everyone wanted to buy something and now it's starting to get back to, well, I can't afford that or I don't want to buy that or it's just not reasonable. So I'm just gonna make something out of what I have or find something cheap and make it, which is where I come in trying to help people understand that you can, you can take the shot and just try. I mean, it doesn't hurt trying. And see no, what there's you can a do, lot, there's, you know? there's, there's a lot to it and there's more to it. And it, it's more than an economic thing and it's more than a kind of necessity thing. It's, there's a kind of a, thing which is like I uh guys driving a Saturn that's I gotta to say see. I like coming to Tennessee because uh, Saturn is the home Tennessee's the home of Saturn is, is it? it I that think maybe. Tennessee I sounds think, like a five speed I think they I think part of the pitch for the Saturn was Tennessee <laughs> I all, know all they have is a car Tennessee but fuel mileage you can order all the Grubhub you want, and you can have Chipotle dropped off at your house or Chick-fil-A or whatever it is, and it may be a, a, a more effective use of your time. Meaning, like, I made, uh, I made uh, chicken paprikash the other day. I've said, okay. I'm going old school, Laszlo Gorog, my step-grandfather. This guy was Hungarian, and I'm cooking Hungarian. Yeah. I went to the store. I dropped about 95 bucks at the store. I came home. I worked about three hours on this thing. I destroyed the kitchen. 
it didn't make any sense practically to do that at all. I would have saved money and saved time by just ordering food and having Grubhub <laughs> come to right. place. But the point is, is I did it. And I'm better for it, is what I'm saying. <laughs> and I feel that way about getting out, wrenching on your cars, making yourself a OSB Lambo, uh, the, the, log, the log hauling Lambo, whatever it is. There's something to it. it, it we try to avoid it. We shouldn't. Right. We should roll our sleeves up and get into it. No, I completely agree. I mean, it's you got to do what you enjoy. And, and a lot of it is like... This truck today is probably $98,000. I'm not paying that, right? It's like, go find an old truck. Just oh, you mean if you want to find a loaded GMC that right. can haul? 100%. Oh, 100%. So it's like, why take a mortgage out on a truck? Go find something old, make it work, make it run, make it drive, get used to it, and then slowly build it up over time and make it into what you want because I'm not going to buy a $100,000 GMC. That's insane. That's a mortgage. Derek, uh, I know... You have an association with O'Reilly Auto Parts. They sponsor this show as well. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about those folks or what your relationship is. Yeah, I mean, I've been using O'Reilly for a couple decades now. And the thing I like most about them is no matter where I go in the U.S., it's consistent. I can walk in. I know the aisles I'm going to. I know what they have on hand. And if they don't have it, they're going to get it to me quick. And it just helps me keep these old rigs on the road. Yeah, you need places like O'Reilly if you're into the hobby, the sport, the lifestyle, the religion, it's all the above because it's not like driving the aforementioned Tesla. You got to be engaged and involved and you need the parts and as much as you can do on your own, you can't make spark plugs. <laughs> 100%, I agree. <laughs> thanks, Derek, and yeah. thanks, O'Reilly. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love uh, how you're rolling and so I want to give you a plug here, Derek. Uh, in the Isles, and that's presented by O'Reilly Auto Parts, and that's available on YouTube, and then also you can watch Derek on his Motor Trend TV show, Roadworthy Rescues as well. Uh, love a car guy. Sorry about the uh, weather, but I uh, appreciate you being flexible oh, and absolutely. Uh, hanging with us, Derek. Absolutely. Welcome to Nashville. This is unseasonable, but here you are. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll roll with the punches. So, until next time, it's Adam Carolla for Jason Whitlock and Derek Fury saying mahalo. <laughs>